We bow down to the Divine Guru who imparts to the disciple the fire of knowledge and burns away the bonds of karma accumulated through many, many births. So, as usual, we have a quotation and questions from Jean, who will, uh, who will I'll hand over to, and she can start a reading. Thank you, Swami J. Hello, everyone. Uh, so for this evening, uh, I have focused on Holy Mother, um, as well as being Holy Mother, but her role as a guru. Um, so. Again, it's taken from Swami Chetananda's book called Sri Sharada Devi and Her Divine Play. So I will read some extracts from a few pages, from page 462, and a few extracts following. A human guru who is an aura of God and an illumined soul plays a vital role in spiritual life. Of course, the real guru is such a Dananda or God, and the spiritual light or power comes from him alone. But when this divine power manifests through some extraordinary illumined souls, they become gurus and have the power to illumine others, just as a lighted candle can light other candles. However, there are false prophets and self-styled gurus in this world. The Katha Upanishad warns us about them, saying, Fools dwelling in darkness, but thinking themselves wise and erudite, go round and round by various tortuous paths, like the blind led by the blind. The Hindu scriptures testify that the divine power does not become fully manifest in the Guru till his or her raw ego is completely wiped out. When this limited I-ness is annihilated, that person becomes an instrument of the cosmic eye or the divine mother. So the power of the guru is not human. It is a divine mother's special power that possesses the guru's body and mind. And moving on, there are many gurus or spiritual teachers in the world, but as manifestations of God's power, all gurus are the same. At the outset of the spiritual journey, one should have love, faith, and steadfast devotion for one's own guru and follow his or her instruction implicitly. Later in the advanced stage, one will realize this truth. My Lord is the Lord of the universe and my guru is the guru of the world. Despite this sublime teaching, some narrow-minded fanatics develop guru cults and think their guru is the greatest. Without understanding the main purpose of the guru, they create various factions and fight to prove the supremacy of their respective gurus. Once Swami Satprakshananda said to Swami Shivananda, some receive initiation from Holy Mother and some from Maharaji, meaning Swami Brahmananda. Is there any difference? Swami Shivananda replied, I don't see any difference. The same Ganges water is coming through two faucets. The same grace of the master is coming through Holy Mother and Maharaj. According to Swami Shivananda, this Ganges water is Ramakrishna, who is purifying and awakening the God consciousness of people who receive initiation from the gurus of the Ramakrishna order. As an incarnation of God, the master always reminded his devotee, Sachidananda 
or God is the only guru, father and master. He could not bear anyone calling him guru, baba, father or karta, master. To avoid developing a narrow guru cult, all gurus of the Ramakrishna order, from Holy Mother and the direct disciples down to the present Swamis, have pointed out that Ramakrishna is the Ishta, or chosen deity, as well as the guru. He is the goal, the support, the Lord, the witness, the abode, the refuge, and the friend. And again, moving on, we come to Holy Mother as the Guru. Ramakrishna said about Holy Mother, Sharada is an incarnation of Saraswati, the goddess of learning. She was born to bestow knowledge upon others. He transferred the results of his spiritual experiences to her and taught her various mantras relating to particular deities, so that she could continue his spiritual ministry after his passing away. In Holy Mother's life, we find the goddess acting as a guru and also as a mother. Swami Gambaparanda described how these three aspects, goddess, guru and mother, blended harmoniously in Holy Mother's life. Whenever she appears to us as a mother, we get a glimpse of her inherent power of imparting that true knowledge that dispels all ignorance. When we approach her as a guru, she draws us to her lap as a mother. And when we recognize the mother and guru in her, we find her seated transcendently in her own divine effulgence. In fact, we cannot discern where any of these mutually dependent aspects end and another begins. Although Holy Mother appeared to be an affectionate and loving mother, it would be a great mistake if we were to consider her an ordinary human being. Truly, the Divine Mother incarnated as Sharada Devi and acted as a human mother and guru. Endowed with divine power, wisdom, glory, purity, renunciation, love and compassion, she awakened spirituality in the hearts of her disciples and granted liberation to them. Moving on. After Ramakrishna's passing away in 1886, Holy Mother spent a year on pilgrimage staying mostly in Rindaban. Her spiritual ministry started at the master's bidding when she gave her first formal initiation in Rindaban to Swami Yogananda. She lived for another 33 years after that. During the first 11 years, 1887 to 1898, she led a secluded life in Kamarpur, Jarambati and Kolkata. During the second 11 years, 1898 to 1909, the public began to hear about her and she initiated a few disciples. During the third 11 years, 1909-1920, she initiated innumerable men and women who came to her from various stations and stages of life. Among them were rich and poor, young and old, students and teachers, lawyers and physicians, noble souls and sinners, revolutionaries and eccentrics. She even initiated a few monastic and householder disciples of the Master, and also some aspirants who came to her from other parts of India and the West, whose languages were unknown to her. Again, moving on, she said, the mantra has an intrinsic power. Holy Mother said, the mantra purifies the body. One becomes pure by repeating the name of God given by the Guru. Once a disciple asked Holy Mother if the mere repetition of the mantra as taught by an adept Guru really helped the aspirant 
if he or she did not possess intense devotion. Holy Mother answered, whether you jump into water or are pushed into it, your cloth will be soaked, will it not? Holy Mother was not an ordinary guru who initiates with elaborate rituals and follows traditional methods. Her initiation was simple and short. She selected the chosen deity and gave the mantra accordingly and showed the disciple how to count repetitions of the mantra on the fingers or a rosary. Swami Ashananda was initiated by Holy Mother. After she passed away, he became Swami Sharadananda's private secretary. When he observed Sharadananda's elaborate method of giving initiation, he said to the Swami, Maharaj, Holy Mother instructed me in a very simple way. She did not ask me to repeat the mantra for a fixed number of times in the morning or evening, or for special days and all that. She did not give me any fixed method, Maharaj, I want a step-by-step -step procedure. Could you please add something? Swami Sharadananda responded, you are the greatest fool. Holy Mother is the Divine Mother herself. All these methods and procedures are given by other teachers, but not Holy Mother. Whatever Holy Mother has given you is the last word in spiritual life. You cling to the mantra, Repeat it, meditate, and think of your chosen idea. And when longing for the vision of God comes, you will find that your mind will know it, that your mind will be fixed on the divine spirit, and that all your desires will be fulfilled. Do you mean to say that I should add something to what Holy Mother has given? It is due to her grace that I am here. And again, moving on. In relation to removing of sin and bad karma. Being a guru is not easy. It is beyond the capacity of an ordinary guru to take responsibility for another's bad karma or to absorb a disciple's sin and its consequences. Only a divine being has power of redemption. Towards the end of Holy Mother's life, when she was bedridden in Udbadan House, Brahmachari Ash was dejected, thinking that he would be helpless without her. To encourage him, she said, do you think that even if this body passes away, I can have any release unless every one of those res whose responsibility I have taken on myself is out of bondage. I must constantly live with them. I have taken complete charge of everything, good and bad, regarding them. Is it a trifle to give initiation? It is a tremendous responsibility. How much anxiety I suffer for them. Just say, your father has died, and that at once made me feel worried about you. I thought, how is it that the master is again putting him to the test? That you may come out of this ordeal is my constant prayer. For this reason, I gave you all this advice. Can you understand everything I'd say? If you could do so, that would lighten my worries to a great extent. The master is playing with his different children in diverse ways. But I have to bear the brunt of it. I cannot simply set aside those whom I have accepted as my own. The relationship between the guru and the disciple is eternal. Holy Mother demonstrated how to lead a spiritual life by continually practicing japa. Even when she was sick in bed, she repeated her mantra mentally. She slept very little. One night, Brahmachari Bharata asked, Mother, don't you get any sleep? She replied, what can I do, my child? All these children come to me with great longing for initiation, but most of them do not repeat the mantra regularly. Why regularly? 
Many do not repeat it at all. But since I have taken responsibility for them, should I not say to their welfare? Therefore, I do joppa for their sake. I constantly pray to the Master, saying, O oh Master, awaken their spiritual consciousness. Give them liberation. There is a great deal of suffering in this world. May they not be born here again. In spiritual life, when clouds of doubt and depression hover in the mind, we need someone to reassure us. Holy Mother told Indubusan Sen Gupta, Why do you worry, my child? You have occupied a place in my heart. You will not have to do any spiritual discipline. I am doing it for you. Indu asked, Mother, do you do the same for all who have received initiation from you? Yes, I do, replied the mother. You have so many disciples. Do you remember them all? I don't recollect them all, but I repeat the mantra for those whose names I can recall. And for those I cannot remember, I pray to the master saying, Master, I have many children in various places. Please look after those whose names I can't recall and take care of their well-being. That's the reading for this evening, Swami. And um, reading this, my questions relate to um, Holy Mother refers to the Guru taking on the sins or bad karma from disciples. Can you please explain this? Will you please explain this? Uh, secondly, uh, will you explain the transference or imparting of spiritual knowledge from guru to disciple? And thirdly, the relationship between guru and disciple is eternal. Will you discuss this, please? Thank you. Good. So thank you, Jean. So there's quite a bit of material there. And uh, if we also read the passages in between those passages, we might glean some understanding. Uh, firstly, <clears throat> the word guru is said to be a compound word, implying that there is a transition between darkness and light. Can one human make such a transition or evoke such a transition in another? And the answer is not as a human. And so in the tradition that we are, that Holy Mother is well versed in and practices in a first hand way, in a direct way, we have to understand, first of all, the position of humility that such gurus take. And secondly, the idea that it has nothing to do with humanity per se, but it has human implications. The finest incarnations are of the type of these incarnations. So Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, these are the twin incarnations, two sides of the same coin. And naturally, Transfer, transference, transmission of power by a touch is possible for the such people, just as it was possible for Christ or for Buddha for that matter. I'll always recall how there's an episode where Jesus and his disciples is trying to enter into Peter's mother-in-law's house. And all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? Who touched? I heard some I felt somebody touch the tassel of my cloak. And he goes on further to make a further description. I felt some power being drawn from me. And Peter argues and says, why do you worry about who touches you? We're trying to get into the house words to that effect. So when we talk of this transmission, we're talking of divine energy. 
And we only know one divine energy. There are not multiple divine energies. In the same way, there are not multiple gurus. And so in the beginning of this chapter that uh, uh, Jean read so nicely for us, we get this idea that the only guru, the true guru, is Satchit Ananda, that is that entity that can only be described as, as existence itself, consciousness itself, and bliss itself, that underlying entity that sits beneath and permeates through all existence. It's unmanifest, but it manifests itself through the woven weave and web, the warp and woof, the fabric of material universe. So a person who is saying, I am a guru, is a sure indication of that person not being a guru. And we have many examples from ancient times and to this moment, and we heard mention of the Katupanishad, the blind leading the blind and both falling into the ditch. And so since probably about the 1960s onwards in the West anyway, there have been people proclaiming that you should have allegiance to me alone. And we see an extension of this in exclusivist religion saying only through my particular brand or version of God, such as only through Jesus, only through Christ, or only through Krishna, or only through this or through that or only through this set of doctrines or dogmas. As soon as we see or hear of exclusivity, rather than unity, of division, rather than oneness, then we should have some kind of suspicion raised in us. So Sri Ramakrishna didn't like the term guru. He didn't like the term teacher. He didn't like the term Baba. None of these terms did he like. He was insistent that the real guru is the Satyadananda, which means that all gurus are really that, the one true guru. But you see the element of transference of power goes like this, and it's very handy to have the analogy referred to partially here, of some reservoir on a hill that feeds a town below with water. We can compare this reservoir on the hill to the divine entity, the infinite invisible, the constant potentiality of creative grace and power. And that Godhead then manifests itself through a pipeline. And the pipeline uses the effect of gravity to move everything down toward the village. Of course, you can't allow the water to flow, otherwise it flood the village. There must be a faucet at the end. And that faucet, when it is open, is a kind of ego that when opened is a manifesting adapter. It uh, acts as a, an opening, a conduit for the full manifestation of the divine grace, an open channel for it. Normally, people have it closed. Normally, people assert this is the only reality. But the one that knows that this divine grace behind all the adapters that we call human body, human mind, and so on, that entity is prepared to open up and transfer all of that to others is called a guru. And so the guru and God are exactly the same, just as the water that flows through the faucet, the water that flows through the pipeline, the water that is contained in the reservoir, is all the same water. So the same divine principle is flowing. Supposing you have a number of taps, supposing you have a dozen of them, then you cannot distinguish between any of the faucets and the water that comes from them. Faucets in themselves are nothing but it is the grace behind them. We can compare these with the ego, which is a closing thing. And when a person says, and says with a sense of exclusivism, I am the guru, don't go to that person, that person not a guru, I am the guru, then we know there's no flow at all of divine grace coming through. 
And that would be like the blind leading the blind. Spontaneously, the Holy Mother was a mother and a guru. And actually, of the two, she was a mother. But mother guru, in her case, was a synonymous term. She had children. And every guru would consider, okay, there are children who rely on me. Now, supposing I go to, let's say, India, and let's say that I visit a dozen temples in significant places, and let's say I see God in all of them, I can't come back to Ireland and report, yes, I went to India, and I caught 12 disciples. So when somebody sees God in the other person, God in the heart of the other being, we can't say that that being is a disciple. So from the so-called Guru's point of view, there are no disciples. There are only in front embodiments of the divine element. And the only joy will be to spread the light to others. See the example was there of a lamp or a light. That's the meaning of the Guru, somebody who gives light to others, removing thereby the darkness. But what person is equipped to do that? The person that themselves understand the light. These are the illumined souls. Now, Swami Sharadananda, for example, would have said, no, we, I need all these things because you know, I'm not the same quality as the Holy Mother. The Holy Mother, a mere, a mere talk, a mere look, a mere touch is enough. That's why her initiation, her diksha, will be extremely simple. So this transference really is to do with this, what is called diksha, and the word diksha also in this text is explained. It is to do with the removal of material attachments, doing away with vasanas, desires. That is enabling that to happen through specific instruction, but mainly it's through a voluntary opening of the ripe ego, just as you open a faucet and the water flows through, divine grace flows through. And that water is exactly the same everywhere, in every faucet, in every guru, therefore, in every power plant, which corresponds to the parampara, the lineage going back to the divine origin that is equivalent to the reservoir. So because of that, because of this flow of grace, is primarily, a primary constitu a constituent is love. And if I love you, if a person says, I love you, then if you have influenza, I'd rather take it from you and I'll bear it myself, isn't it? Such a rare love that is. If somebody says, what an unfortunate thing, you had an accident. I wish I had had the accident in, uh, myself instead of you. Nobody says it. Only somebody with that generosity of spirit will say, I'll take it on me voluntarily. Because the minute that the teacher engages with the student with a sense of love, a sense of flow, a sense of devotion, then all the causal relationship gets exchanged. The causal relationship from the guru to the student gets exchanged. The student becomes, has, has the light given to them. But on the other hand, whatever that student has, the guru freely takes on themselves, the consequences of their actions. So that the Holy Mother was quite happy, quite prepared to give anybody who called her mother. And it wasn't a choice for her, just a spontaneous reaction. Oh, I have to do it. I have to do something because this person is my child. And then for that reason, won't you do anything for your child? Won't you sacrifice? Won't you starve so that the child can eat? Won't you have that self-sacrificing temperament? If faced with a choice, 
my child will die or me. I say, let me die instead. Let the child have a full life. So this is really love. This is real, real love. And so the first question, taking on the bad and good karma, whatever it is, all the sins. And you'll see that these avatars exhibited how freely they did it, how generously and universally they did it. This is behind the theology of Jesus on the cross, suffering for the sins of others, sins of the whole of humanity. With that theology aside, we can see it from this point of view, that out of sheer love, you'll take everything on me, please. I'll be the sacrificial lamb, if you will. Buddha was the embodiment of compassion. He even said when asked, uh, is animal sacrifice a good thing in temple worship? He said, well, why are you sacrificing an animal? Because it's the best, the best in agricultural production. It is the most valuable thing to a human. He said, well, in that case, since you think that I am perfect, since you think I'm the best among humans, why don't you sacrifice me? So that indicates a red, readiness, a kind of sense of humor too, by the way, and a wisdom behind it, but a readiness to go to the slaughterhouse if that's what was required. Self-sacrificing attitude completely. And so that is what the uh, mother does. The mother takes on the sins and the bad karma, the bad effects of others, and all generations of gurus will want to do the same. And having said that, the flow of grace is much more. You can imagine, you see, if you have this faucet, coming back to that analogy, you have this divine reservoir on the top of the hill, the sheer force of gravity going down the hill, say several kilometers, that sheer force, if you open it fully, you'll flood the whole town. So the flow which is there, which is a controlled thing, will spread its grace generously to all beings. So yes, all this affects as soon as there is a guru that is prepared to honestly give diksha either through various methods, either through, either through a touch, either through a scene, either through instruction, or through ritual or whispering the mantra in the devotee's ear, will have to assert, I have a responsibility. My responsibility, I have to look after you. Well, how long will you look after me for? Forever. No limit to it. Why should there be a limit to it? That entity understanding their oneness with the cosmic mind will be there forever. That's the commitment made. And so the eternal relation is there. That's question three. The eternal relation is set up and the eternal relation is, is there regardless of living or dying because you can't accept that death is an end at all. It's not a full stop, the mere comma. This continuation of life is assured through the law of causality that never ends. If it ended, the universe will end. The universe is founded on the deterministic principle of cause or relationships. And the cause and effect are the same. There's a law of conservation. The sum total of energy, some total of matter, always remains the same. It just gets transformed. So this transforming of human life is there. But the gurus of gurus, that is the incarnations, ah, their grace is incomparable. Their power is by mere look, by mere touch, and the whole life gets transformed, the whole nation gets transformed, the whole of humanity gets transformed. For thousands of years to come, this giant wave comes and sweeps everything aside and has its impact generations and generations to come. And then the transference of spiritual knowledge and light 
is, is there and is done principally through the means of a mantra. And the Holy Mother shows how it's done. She reflects and waits and listens. And when the right mantra, that is the sound embodiment of the chosen ideal of the devotee comes, she'll give it. Sometimes she may have to wait for that to come. So that is the Hindu is asking, Mother, do you do the same for all who have received initiation from you? This one-on-one -on -one instruction, this one-on-one -on -one personalized identification of the Ishtadeva, the chosen ideal, and its corresponding mantra. Then you used to have so many disciples. Do you remember them all? I don't recollect them all. There's hundreds and hundreds of people going to her. But I repeat the mantra for those whose names I can recall. And for those I cannot remember, I pray to the master saying, Master, I have many children in various places. Please look after those whose names I can't recall and take care of their well-being. There are some practical indications about, about this the question of Diksha, and I'm going back in the same chapter. It says the Guru transmits spiritual power during the initiation ceremony and connects the disciple with God through a mantra. And Sri Ramakrishna compared the process to a matchmaker. My dear, this is your form of God. This is your beloved. Beloved, this is your devotee. And this is the mantra that links you all, the private, the private uh, communication line, if you will, that connects. So this is called Diksha or initiation. According to the Tantra, D means Tiyati Jnanam or gives knowledge. And Ksha means Kshiyati Pashu Vasana or destroys the biological or the animal or the worldly desires in a person that stand in the way. And according to the Agama to scriptures, Supreme Lord, Shiva, because it phrases everything in terms of Shiva Shakti. So the great uh, Shiva established three kinds of initiation. Shambhavi Shakti and Mantri, when a disciple attains knowledge instantly by merely seeing, touching, or paying obeisance to the Guru. It is called Shambhavi initiation when that happens. And when an illumined guru transmits his or her divine power into the disciple's heart and awakens spirituality, it is called Shakti initiation. In the mantri initiation, the guru draws a diagram, installs a ghat or sacred picture, picture uh, performs worship of the deity, and then utters a mantra into the ear of the disciple. These two things are there. When the disciple repeats the mantra, while fixing the mind with the important thing on the Ishta, his or her worldly desires subside and the mind becomes pure. And at that time, the mind becomes the Guru or acts like the Guru. And actually, the word mantra is connected with the mind. Mananat, Trayati, Iti, Mantraha. That word is the mantra upon which one reflects to attain salvation. It's amazing how the infinite God remains hidden in this Bija Mantra, the seed form, seed mantra. So this transference is there by means of the fact that at that point, the person giving the Mantra Diksha is thoroughly aligned with the cosmic mind. The part of Nostra, the Christian prayer, says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Another way of saying that may my will and your divine will be aligned. Let there be no obstacle. Let there be a free flow of truth and of divine energy. And divine energy, if it's a flow, doesn't go merely from one point to the other. It goes to all points everywhere in a generosity of spirit. 
the master used to say, the guru is like a female companion of Radha, as there's no end to her love errands until her friend Radha is united with Krishna. He refers to the relationship between Krishna and the combined uh, devotees, uh, Radha, seen as the beloved. We have seen how Sri Krishna becomes something like that, his love of God from the point of view of making God his beloved. So, so there is no rest for the Guru until the spiritual aspirant is united with God. Thus the great Guru accompanies the sincere devotee to higher and higher realms of spirituality and finally presents the devotee to the chosen deity saying, my child, look there. And then immediately the Guru disappears. As compared to Ramakrishna's example of two friends who come across a wall, they don't know what's behind it, but they hear a lot of jollity going on behind. A great deal of celebration. Catching a ladder, the one climbs up the wall and his friend is expecting a report back, what's happening on the other side. So enthralled is he with all the magnificent goings on that he immediately forgets everything, climbs over the wall and joins the celebrations. And his friend climbs the same ladder, what became of my friend, looks over the wall, sees the jollity, sees the tremendous celebrations going on, unparalleled, and instead of going over the wall, he goes back and tells others, come, come, see this. So a guru should be a gentleman in the normal sense of the word guru, not a divine guru, but a, a guru, the ordinary faucet, is a gentleman, a gentle person. What they will say is, you first, please. You please get your liberation. It's worth emphasizing what was read earlier, that once Swami Sutprakashananda said to Swami Shivananda, some receive initiation from Holy Mother and some from Maharaj, that is Swami Brahmananda. Is there any difference? Swami Shivananda replies, I don't see any difference. The same Ganges water is coming through the two faucets. This is where the idea of the faucets is coming. The same grace of the Master is coming through Holy Mother and Maharaj, both. And according to Swami Shivananda, the Ganges water is Ram Krishna, who is purifying and awakening the God consciousness of people who receive initiation from the Gurus of the Ram Krishna order. So another way of saying that is it comes from the cosmic mind. It is the cosmic mind from which everything comes, the personal God. It is worth going to the very beginning of this chapter that was quoted concerning Holy Mother as Guru. It begins with the simple fundamental explanation. It's extremely important to understand the concept of the Guru and his or her role in awakening spiritual consciousness. And that one sentence tells you the job is to awaken the consciousness in others. You can't do it unless you are awake yourself. According to the Vishwasara Tantra, Gu means darkness or ignorance, Ru means remover or destroyer. In other words, the person who removes ignorance or the veil or misunderstanding or mistake, mistake that we call Maya from the minds of the disciples is a Guru. If you can do that, you're a Guru. But if you're just posturing, if you're just claiming, if you're just wanting to have some adoration come your way. And this is so obvious in dramatic ways from the 1960s onwards. You can main, name many, many people who have elevated themselves. I remember, I'm not mentioning any names, but there was when I was uh, young and uh, around about the 1960s, let's say 60s or 70s, it was well known that there was a child guru 
and this child was said to be 14 years. They were 14 years old for quite a few years. And uh, they said, you see, I'm greater than Jesus. Jesus came by donkey. Me, I came by jumbo jet. And I think they were quite serious about it in their naive uh, state of teenagehood. And so if you're not removing the ignorance of another, then you cannot really be called this person who enlightens another and removes the darkness of their ignorance. Human beings suffer because of ignorance. And this ignorance can be banished only by knowledge of God. That's the only antidote to ignorance would be knowledge. Vedanta says that people are hypnotized by this maya, that is this apparent world. They must learn to dehypnotize themselves with self-knowledge, which leads to liberation. Ram Krishna described the role of the guru with the parable of the tiger, the lion and the goats. A pregnant tiger gave birth to a baby goat and died. Seeing that this was an orphan, the surrounding goats could took compassion, took this cub in, brought them up as their own, and this poor cub thought, I am a tiger, I am a goat. So as a baby goat, he would wander around bleating, eating vegetarian food. But one day a tiger came and attacked the same flock. And he was amazed to see the grass eating tiger and running after it, the wild tiger at last seized this poor goat. And of course, this lion cub, or this tiger cub, I should say, who is really uh, under the appearance of a bleating goat, began naturally to bleat until the tiger dragged this goat, or I should say this cub, to the water's edge. Look, he said, you and I are exactly the same. Don't you see? And gradually, uh, he wasn't, there was lust on the lion cub, or the tiger cub, I should say. And so he pointed out, here's a little meat. This is what we eat. Eat it. And saying that, he thrust some meat into the mouth. And the grass-eating tiger couldn't and wouldn't swallow it and began to bleat. Please save my life. And gradually, however, it got the taste of blood trickling down its throat. And that was enough. He relished the meat and he discovered his own inner tigerhood and he roared. But the tiger who showed him, this is you, you are actually a tiger. This is what a guru does and what a guru is. A human guru who is a knower of God and an illumined soul plays a vital role in the spiritual life. In any tradition, Western tradition is called confessor or spiritual director, any of these terms. But of course, it has to be repeated over and over again that the real guru is this Satchit Ananda or what we call God. There's the story in the story of Rama where the great, great devotee of Rama and Sita is Hanuman. Now, Hanuman, of course, as a mere monkey is equivalent to the indisciplined mind. But the disciplined mind is strong and has such huge manifested potential to leap over oceans, to make themselves big or small, they have unlimited powers on the basis that they are the disciplined mind and therefore the guru. And for that reason, Hanuman is said to be the eternal guru. It never ends. When Ram, Lakshman and so on and so forth go off to, eventually to the heavens, having done their time, played their part on this earth, Anjanaya, Hanuman is left behind. No, no, you can't come with us. You are here as the eternal guru. The Hindu scriptures testify that the divine power does not come, become fully manifest in the guru till his or her raw ego is completely wiped out. So the one fundamental thing is, 
with the restricting, closing, mean. Egocentricity has to go. It has to be opened. And the ego then becomes ripe and becomes manifesting. It becomes an open channel for love. It becomes an open channel for selfless activity, spirit of service. And then the text that was read out talks about Holy Mother as Saraswati. Saraswati, the dynamic creative aspect of this whole creation of the whole of cosmic mind. And so naturally, she's a guru. She's a god, she's a guru, she's a mother. Redemption is there for everybody, but the redemption comes from this sense of openness. The redemptive or salvific value of such an all-giving entity transforms not only a person, but as I said before, a nation and the whole of mankind for thousands of years to come. It's a tremendous responsibility. There are such systems today, meditation systems, and the participant is given a so-called mantra. When you ask, what does this mantra mean? He said, I have no idea. The person you gave it, do they have some idea? No, they also have no idea. And so you can't have anybody doing this because this huge, tremendous responsibility. You're adopting, as it were, children, your own children, and you yourself are responsible for them. Whether they know it or not, in the darkness of night, you'll have to pray for their welfare. And the prayer has no validity unless the person praying is pure in heart themselves, the embodiment of purity and goodness, generosity and pure love. So may they be born again. No, we don't want people to be born again if they can't help it. Why would you wish somebody to go through the pain of misery? So our aim is this goal of freedom. It's not this goal of eternal paradise or anything like that, because paradise is made from parts. It's a non-lasting thing. It will disintegrate. Even if you have a God made from parts, it will disintegrate. If you have a God that sits there in potentiality, it means sometimes potential and sometimes kinetic, says Swami Vivekananda. And that can never be, because if it is changeable, then it is perishable. So I hope then that I have answered these questions. And uh, if so, then we'll happily leave it at that. Thank you. Yes, Swami, thank you so much. That was. Uh extremely illuminating. That was lovely. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Oh.